Hello, hello, my friends. Yes, it's coming down into summer, closer into summer. It was warm out there on the street today, but I had one person who took the Spanish Bible and seemed grateful for it. He was probably only, I don't know, 12, 13, 14. And um, so I'm praying that he will read. That's good. We are in Matthew 8 today, Matthew 8, 10, and 11. And then we will go to Matthew 22, 31 to 33. Matthew 8, 10 to 11, but you know, I want to pray before we read. Well, Lord God in heaven, we praise you. We honor you. We uh, come to your word with gratefulness and joy. And we ask for your presence to help us understand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 8, 10 and 11. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them who followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew 22 31. Matthew twenty two thirty one, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of, Jake, of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. That's the reading of Matthew 8, 10 through 11, and Matthew 22, 31 through 33. Every day was Resurrection Day. For the early Christians described in the book of Acts, every day was a good day to preach the death and resurrection of Jesus. The day of Jesus' death was the darkest of days. Not only were they bereft of their best friend, but their hopes of rising with him to national greatness lay dashed at their feet. The goals that had energized them no longer held any power or interest. Furthermore, many people had reason to wonder if their demons would return or if their blindness, lameness, or deafness would come again. Without the freedom lover and joy giver alive on earth, would their freedom and joy disappear? It was the darkest of days. Early on the first day of the week, things began to change. Fear and death began to work backward for the first time in history. The minute Jesus had stayed dead long enough to fully conquer death and its author, the devil, he rose from the dead and burst forth from the tomb, appeared here and there to his, his people, and depended on them to tell the fantastic story. No other God known to humans had ever taken the dregs of death for his people. No other God known to humans had ever died and risen again as a human. Sure, there were the fertility gods who supposedly slept or died or went into exile in the winter and in the spring woke up, came to life, or returned from exile. This was the yearly cycle of many of the gods. Jesus was different from them. He came and lived among people for more than a yearly cycle, and then only once died, and rose to be a living God among us now. He does not die every year. He lives forever as a friend in the heavenly court and as the king of the universe. My friends, let these things bathe your mind because they are true. 
and truer than any news you will hear on television or social media or from a friend. Let your imagination paint each picture of this last weekend and hear each whisper or sob. Then let your feelings grasp the breakthrough, the breathtaking hope, the gasp of happy surprise. Let the risen Christ appear in your imagination. Let him walk with you and explain things to you. When I say let your imagination paint pictures and let your feelings grasp hope, and let the risen Christ appear. I mean the let, because he is here, and you can imagine truth. Do not close it off. Let us keep the risen Christ before our mind's eye continually. For the first story of today's double, we will study someone who did just that. And Jesus commended his faith. He was not a Jew. He was a leader of the hated Roman soldiers, foreigners who were occupying Israel by force. If Jesus had gone to this man's house, Jesus would have been considered unclean and not welcome in his own society. The man came to Jesus, desperate for healing for his servant. Jesus said, I will come. The man said, no, do not come because I am not worthy that you come to my house. It seems to me there are two possible sources of this man's feeling of unworthiness. On the one hand, perhaps he had internalized the marginalization from the Jews among whom he lived. Perhaps he knew of the uncleanness that Jesus would accrue by associating with him. On the other hand, and perhaps simultaneously, he, being a man of power among humans, recognized in the presence of Jesus a power far surpassing any he had ever encountered. Perhaps he alone, among the crowds, experienced the appropriate awe. He said, You can do this from here with only a word. I know because I can tell people what to do and they do it. I know that you can tell illness what to do and it will do it. Jesus marveled that here and not in all Israel had he found such faith. It was faith. To recap, faith is great sense of unworthiness coupled with great confidence in Jesus. Then Jesus said, Many will come from all directions, not only Jews, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jews were descendants of Abraham and claimed some sort of favored status because of their ancestry. Jesus said, Many non Jews will also sit down with Abraham. I wondered if this sit down would indicate a banquet, a conversation, or something else. And I found nothing in the Old Testament to illuminate the idea. Though some of Jesus' parables and teachings did mention feasts and guests and once even sitting there's nothing in them to make context for this sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, we will gather context from the story before us. In this case, from the setting, we deduce that the sit down indicates belonging, safety, togetherness, and more deeply, finding a home. Even people who have been othered will find a place and welcome. Moving to the matching phrase on the other side of the mountain, some of the Pharisees had quizzed Jesus all day, trying to trick him into saying something they could blow out of context and out of proportion to turn the crowds or at least the government against him. When they gave up, 
some of the Sadducees stepped up with a trick question about the resurrection. This was the more secular and educated party in Jerusalem. They believed what they could see and touch. They did not believe in miracles or anything supernatural. Surely they did not believe in a resurrection sometime off in the future from which life would continue in a state of blessedness. Jesus chided them for not knowing their Hebrew scriptures, yet he chose a novel way to teach the resurrection from the Old Testament. He asked, Have you not read about our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They said quite patronizingly, Yes, of course. Jesus gave the punchline. God is a God of the living, not of the dead. He left the implied deduction unsaid, awaiting their own aha. There certainly will be a resurrection. So God can be God of all of his people who have lived and died throughout the ages. The trick questions were silenced, and the people were astonished at his teaching. Perhaps they remembered his earlier reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and recognized the broadening of their view. Jesus' use of these names worked in their minds toward first seeing all people from all over the earth, and second, toward seeing all people from all generations and centuries of existence on earth. We have found the phrase Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob twice in Matthew, once in the narrative after the first sermon, and then again in the narrative before the fifth sermon. The two instances match in placement, flanking the central chapter, Matthew 13. It is as if we went up the mountain past that phrase and came down the mountain to find that phrase again, in return order, of course, with deepening meaning. To understand its deeper meaning, we will examine the phrase in the Old Testament. Joseph seems to be the first to cite his three forefathers by name all in a row, and he links them to the promise of the land which God will give them. Then God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he heard the groaning of Israel in their slavery in Egypt. The first time God claimed to be God of them was when Moses came to a burning bush in the desert and heard God's voice sending him to Egypt to deliver his people. Four times at the very beginning of their nation, God explicitly identified himself or told Moses to identify this God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Throughout Moses' writing, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is quoted or cited as the God of Israel, often connected with the covenant with them as a people or with the land and the pro that was promised them. In the stories we read today, Jesus reached back to the covenant and the general belief among those in his audience in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With this affirmation of their past and their belief in this God, Jesus introduced the breadth of God's kingdom, including many others outside Judaism. And Jesus introduced the length of God's kingdom, including all generations. Jesus included people from all nations and states of life. Jesus included people from all days and centuries of the past. In order to have all his people together one day, he will have a resurrection. His own resurrection will be first, and then every person who believes on him will have his or her own part in resurrection. Let us receive humility and confidence every day. 
Let us trust that Jesus, what Jesus says he will do. Let us participate in the resurrection every day. And then one day, find our place, our sit-down home in God's kingdom. With the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to pray for us. O oh, Holy Father, we come to you as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the living and not the dead. The God who will call our relatives and friends back to life. Those we have lost to death. We worship you today because you have authority over death. And we look forward to the big resurrection of all those people who love you. And please forgive us where we have failed you, where we have hurt others in our efforts to find our way without God, without you. We ask for your forgiveness and we thank you for it. We believe that's why you sent Jesus to earth so that we could be forgiven. And then Lord, we ask for your help for us here on earth. We ask for your presence with those suffering. We ask for your guidance with those making decisions. And we ask for your love for our neighbors. There are some of my friends who are lacking resources or trying to heal, or maybe they're long ways away, needing help with relationships. You know who they are. You know how to come into their lives and heal them. That's what we're asking today. And then, Lord, we think about the world and we recognize that there is so much trouble in our world. So many who sense some lies and untruths going about in the world and it troubles them immensely. Lord, I ask that all those who don't know you as the truth, that they will come to know you. I ask that you will be known, become known as the answer to all of our problems, to many more people in this world. I ask that you will please bless those who are contemplating or executing war at this moment and those who are suffering in war. I ask that the decisions that you allow will be those that you can use to bring in your kingdom on this earth. That's what we pray for. And we know you, you can do it. We know that it's your desire because we have noticed in your prayer, prayer you taught us to pray, that you ask us to pray that God's kingdom will come. So that's what we're praying. We thank you that we can pray this in confidence, in faith. We've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm Wilma Zalabach. I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship. Grace Chapel Fellowship is a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity. And yes, there are about a half dozen uh, 
themes that keep surfacing in my uh, study and preaching. One, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, I can't do it, but God can. And I decide to let God. Two more. The Bible is worth reading. And the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. And so, until next time, I wish you that the Lord bless you and keep you.